So, uh, coming up here in January will be the beginning of year 15. 15 years, yeah, since retiring as a judge and you and me engaging in this endeavor. So I had somebody the other day go, it's been 14 years already. And I was like, some day, some days it's like, wow, it's only been 14 years. Some days it's like, it's been only 14 years. You know, time flies when you're having fun. What can I, say? <laughs> I don't know if we're having fun all the time, but so uh, let's, let's flash back then. Uh, it does actually start in 2008. Yeah, it does. So uh, Jamie and I were teaching and uh, very we had poor. real jobs. <laughs> yeah, real jobs. Very poor. Uh, very much not sure what was next because I had made the wise decision of getting a degree in which you could do one of two things. Ask if you want fries with that or teach. Right. And uh, there wasn't much upward mobility apart from graduate school of some sort. So it ended up through a series of circumstances being law school and the University of Akron. And too much to everybody's surprise, because I said I would never become a lawyer, I started on that path. Now, 2008 was interesting in its own regard. You were, like I said at the beginning, you were year 19 of being a common police court judge for, in Holmes County. And uh, let's be honest about this. Were you really like, boy, this is everything I ever wanted it to be when you were judge? Well, for the first 10, 15 years or so, yes. But during, let's say since about 2005-ish, it, the the uh, the weight of making important decisions for people that you carry around in your own head tends to warp your sense of reality, and it's very isolating. Um, because believe it or not, not all the judges and lawyers go to the bar on Friday night and talk about their clients. I know that that in small towns, that's the oh yes, yeah, so I've got to get somebody from out of town because my lawyer talks about me with everybody else. That's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, being a judge is very isolating. I was getting borne down on sending young people to prison, which if you care about people at all, it eventually wears you down. I'd been there, done that, got the T-shirt on everything, been part of two death penalty pan uh, panels, um, heard cases. The chief justice had assigned me, I think, about 35 of the 88 Ohio counties mm -hmm. So I got around a little bit, and uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was kind of not challenged anymore, and therefore, that kind of leads to a bit of burnout. Sure. And uh, all I remember of that three years is having a kid in the first semester, which at least you were smart enough to wait until your second to last semester before you had uh, a kid when you were in law school. Well, I think that was you. And yes. it was at the start of the second year. There you go. And mine yes. was the start of the first year. Right. And so it, it is a blur of three years for me. Okay. But I do remember in 2009, it was a year and a half into me going to law school. And you're like, I could retire. Yeah. We could open a practice. Yeah, I've got 30 years uh, coming up in 2010. And uh, 30 years of service, for those of you who are public employees know, that's when you can retire with full benefits under the, uh, benefits under the uh, public employees retirement system. So uh, basically, and I didn't really, everybody asked me, why don't you want to run for the Court of Appeals, you know, go, go higher in the judicial ranks. Um, at that time, the largest county in our Court of Appeals District was Stark County. All the judges were from Stark County right. because that's where all the voters were. So I didn't really want to go out and, and campaign into Hinterlands. And that's changed quite a bit in that district because of the growth of the counties around Columbus, mm -hmm. like Lancaster, Delaware, Fairfield. And so you, now you're seeing judges elected from uh, somewhere other than Stark County. But uh, yeah, it was, it was time to make a move. Plus, you got to at some point say, what is your first best destiny? And my first best destiny was not being a referee. I, well, if for, for anybody who has a classic Star Trek, you actually yes. said something at that time that was a quote of James Kirk. Yeah, it's James Kirk to John Luke Picard in the first Next Generation movie. 
Uh, it's where they once again destroy the enterprise. But um, it's a uh, it is. Uh, Kirk is saying, don't let them kick you up to the Admiralty. If your first best destiny is being the captain of a starship in battle, then uh, then that's what you ought to do. And, and that's kind of the realization I came to. I was in the courtroom all the time, but as a presiding officer, as a judge, it's quite a bit different than representing your client and doing um, mental gymnastics and playing the chess moves with your opponent, which is really that's my first best destiny, being a trial lawyer. And so mid-2009, towards the, the end of that summer, right. I'm starting my second year in earnest at, at law school, and you're like, let's do this. Let's, I'll clerk, I, I would clerk for you. I would, I, I think I did everything except practice law. You definitely learned the... Part of the practice of law that I never had an experience with, that is, how do you run the books? How do you, how do you account for your time? How do you um, do the business of law, which is something that I was never trained in. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, your, your, your ability in between classes to come in and set up trust accounts and, uh, and run the business and, and et cetera was, was, uh, was the way it made, made me work because then I could focus on representing people. And that was kind of the understanding going into it. But let's, let's stop for a moment because late fall, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that you were going to open up a practice by yourself. That's right. We actually were talking to several. We were talking to several other uh, firms in the area, and um, some of them were interested. Some of them weren't. I think I think they recognized, and this is something we experienced. Um, the robe tends to follow you when you're a judge. You know, people don't ver- have very high opinions of lawyers. Maybe thirty-five percent in any opinion poll will say I trust a lawyer. But 85% say, I trust a judge. Mm -hmm. And I go, what's the difference other than a robe? You're a lawyer who won an election, you know. But, um, yeah, that then tends to follow you. Even now, almost 15 years after I retired, people still call me judge. Um, And uh, so you can't leave the robe behind. There's a long long serving sheriff here in Holmes County. And if, if, and when he decides to retire, he's always going to be sheriff. Right. Okay. Right. So there's that public perception that for the first several months, we kind of had to overcome in the practice that, Oh, I could hire Tom. Right. Tom's, you know, Tom's not just the judge anymore. So, uh, but it, and, and it's also a non-traditional career path. Most people, if I would have stayed, with the job, kept getting reelected. I'd be in my last term at this point in time because you can't run after you turn seventy. Right. So, um, but which some of your contemporaries have maintained their path towards that. They have, and uh, but the problem is you don't tend to outlast the job much if the job is your life. Right. I, I'll I'll never forget that you're talking about the fall of two thousand nine before I retired in January of two thousand ten. I found myself, most courtrooms have photographs or paintings of former judges uh, around. And I looked up at the, at the wall and I figured everybody on that wall is dead. Yeah. Except for they had put my, my portrait up and I go, everybody up there is dead except you, Tom, you need to get out of here before this place kills you. So, uh, yeah, I was ready to move on. Well, that was, that's even after rehabbing this third floor of the courthouse. You, you, I mean, it wasn't just practice. I feel like you did everything you could have done at that courthouse, including putting a stamp of updating the color schemes, sure. painting the memorial wall in the back for the Vietnam vets. You know, it just, you know, it was like you did everything. We had, you know, left our mark left our mark on, on the courthouse, hopefully had done a good job in 20 years of uh, making the difficult calls. That's the, basically the job of the judge is not to make easy calls because easy calls get worked out between people. It's making the difficult calls. Who gets custody of the kids? Who goes to prison? Who doesn't? If you go to prison, how long? Um, how you see a, a complex business litigation, et cetera. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of what they call judicial discretion in the job. Plus, 
for your community, you are kind of the face of the community's conscience. You speak for the community and saying, this is a standard that we have. It might be a state law, but this is how we enforce it here in this community. And, um, and that can be a bit of a burden sometimes. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good move for me. It was a good move. So before we jump into 2010, mm-hmm. there was a conversation that is stuck in my head. We were talking to another practitioner um, about you retiring, whether it made sense to go in together. Right. And during the course of that, um, I had laid out our business plan, what we thought we could do in the first year of practice. And I remember being laughed at in that meeting because that was more than that practitioner had ever done Yeah. on an annual basis. That stuck with me. That really informed part of what I would want us to become in that we could understand how to practice. We could understand this business of law. And that, at that time in 2000, late 2009, I did not know what the delivery of legal services as a business really, really would look like. But something settled in on me at the end of 2009 that we could figure this out. Well, the, the whole concept was we're, we both grew up in a rural area, okay? And the concept among many people is, is that in order to get excellent legal services, you have to go to a city, mm-hmm. okay? That's, that's something that, that we have kind of attempted to use as fuel yeah. for us and also uh, something that we've tried to, to fight against, that we can deliver excellent, top-quality legal services but not be from a megalopolis. Uh, you know, you're not from a huge firm that has three floors on a skyscraper in, in downtown Cleveland or Columbus or Cincinnati. And, uh, and so I think we use that kind of people laughing at us as a, uh, as a fuel because we're not traditional. Got a guy who is, uh, you know, we're starting a firm and he's had 30 years of public service. And then you got a guy who's in law school who is making a, not a midlife career change, but near midlife near career midlife. change. Yep. And uh, and having kids and everything. And plus, let's let's look at it. 2009, 2010, the middle of the Great Recession. It was bad as a time. family, we never do things easy. Nope. We never do things easy. So And I remember that because let's jump forward then to 2010. Mm-hmm. January, you formally retire. Yep. And you open up White Law Office. Correct. No initials after it, nope. no no modifiers, nothing else. White law office. Right. Uh, you're the practicing attorney. I'm clerking. I'm answering phones. I'm, you know, handling filings. I did get my mediation license so I could help a little bit on that side of things. You remember, and I remember you saying it was the waiting. Yeah. I remember the first day, I think I retired on January 26th, didn't take any time off, which wasn't a smart thing to do. But on the 27th, sitting at my desk, looking at the phone, wondering if it's ever going to ring. Right. And it was several days before it actually rang. So there was, but we had planned for that. We had a reserve and et cetera. So, you know, we weren't going to starve. Plus, got a very nice pension from the state of Ohio. And and that kind of bridged us over. But yeah, it uh, it was kind of, how do we get the word out? Um, I mean, I remember a couple of really nice newspaper articles that people knew I was retiring. They knew that we were going to offer mediation services in addition to legal services. And, um, but just kind of waiting for that to seep in to kind of, for people to see through the robe and see me in a, in a new role. Uh, yeah, it took a while. It did. And let's get clear too about our vision is not what Equus has ended up being. We no, had a very defined vision at the beginning. Correct. <laughs> is not ended up what it is. Our, our business vision was going to be you and me, no staff, small boutique firm. We would just do what basically what I did as a judge, uh, civil, criminal, and domestic relations representation and mediation. 
And uh, no, that has... And I was just supposed to bring up the tale on transactional. That's right. I was supposed to learn the property and the dead people and the right. <laughs> dirt. And you, you draft the deeds and wills and keep track of keep track of all that. But yeah. Because yeah, we thought, hey, technology, and this is funny to look back on it in the rise of AI in the last two years, but we're like, hey, technology can make this happen. Well, I think we were the first. That's another thing they laughed at us about is we would have no file cabinets. Right. Everything would be digital. All, all the documents that came in and a ton of documents come into any law practice uh, would be scanned, would be available wherever we were so long as we had Internet access. Um, the use of computerized case management to run our calendars, our tasks, our, our billing, you know, et cetera. Yeah, that was all pretty new back back then, at least in this area. Well, moreover, we were operating out of where we were living. Right. <laughs> at one time, we had four generations in that building. It was, yeah, I mean, to put it in perspective for anybody listening is like we had, you had a... 10,000 square foot Victorian house that used to be an Airbnb or used to be a B and B sorry, right. pre Airbnb, yeah, pre Airbnb. <laughs> and so yep. used to be a B and uh, bed and breakfast. And uh, you guys had wrapped that up in a while before, which was actually good timing for Jamie and I, because we ended up sitting on a house in Lancaster, Ohio that we couldn't sell because right. I was sitting in class watching the stock market plummet right. uh, in real time. And so we ended up sitting there and we're able to stay with you guys. And there was multiple floors and multiple places um, and a child running yep. around. Yep. Uh, it was a very some, organic experience. Some, sometimes clothes, sometimes not. Sometimes clothes, sometimes I remember, not. <laughs> uh, I remember her running around with in a state of undress and my clients looking at her as she ran past and then her mother running past to catch her. Um, and I just turned and I said, yes, that's my granddaughter. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she also had a desk beside mine, if you'll remember. And that old desk is still at our house, actually. And she would draft her pleadings and we would take them over and the judge would have them time stamped and we'd bring back and we'd say, you, you're a real lawyer. You've got a pleading in court. So, well, uh, and uh, she apparently had listened to us long enough that she was giving advice. And that's one of your favorite stories from yeah. that early time. What, what was her advice again? I think it was the day that we found out that you had passed the bar examination and we were kind of sitting toasting the day and... Um, and she is working at her desk, and all of a sudden she stands up and she says, Clients, clients, the policeman will come. When he comes, do not talk to him. And then she sat back down. And you were thinking, <laughs> what kind of an environment is my daughter growing up in? And I was thinking, if my three-year-old granddaughter can get that, why can't my 21-year-old exactly. clients exactly. get that? Because everybody's smarter than the cops. I'm going to talk my way out of this. So we, it, was, it was quite something those first couple of years. I mean, that first year, it took a bit. It took a bit to pick up a head of steam. And I, I remember we had set a goal for year one. And it was the goal I got laughed at and right. at the end of 20. And we just crossed it right in year one. And that was a big deal. That was a, was. That was a big deal. And we look now, and we need that much that we did in year one about every week of the firm operates. Yeah, I don't, you know, you now run all the, the, logistics and all the financial stuff. So I don't even know what we need. And quite honestly, I kind of don't want to know. It probably scare me <laughs> of what we need with, with what, uh, with what the firm has become. But, uh, yeah, we, we would celebrate. And as a matter of fact, I think during that first year, toward the end of the year, we actually hired our first employee because we, did. we were so busy. We did. And while well, I was still in law school yep. and, uh, there was just a limitation to what I could offer at that point in time. And so we made it through 2010, uh, 11 month a year, met our goal. Mm hmm. And then in 2011, we kind of had a, a little bit of steam. We did. Going, not anything like what we knew the firm was going to end up being, but we had a little bit of steam rolling. Plus, you put several stars together in a, um, in a constellation. And uh, I'm not sure when in 2011 it was, but I remember you coming in and saying, what do you know about oil and gas law? Yeah. And I go... Not much in Ohio because it's not very well developed. I had cases, oil and gas cases, when I was a judge that I heard. 
And you said, I think that there may be a niche. We were talking about, we were reading about Scottish crofting. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, yep. About how in a small Scottish village, there are these common lots that are divided up. And depending upon what you think will do well in a given year, that's the crop you put in that croft, in that, in that small lot. And so we were trying to look for different niches that we could fill. And the niche that you identified was representing landowners in southeastern Ohio because the oil and gas boom was just kicking off. And so uh, I remember two things in 2011. One was you and I spoke up at the Research and Development Center in Worcester. Yes. And we met a guy named Dick Emmons, who's the grandfather of oil and gas law in Ohio. And he liked us, and so we started working with him. And also we met a guy named Dale Arnold from mm -hmm. the Farm Bureau. And uh, Dale Arnold sabotaged us. How's that? He, he, he lied to us about his intentions. Oh, that's right. Front. He vetted you, didn't he? <laughs> he showed up to ask me questions post-bar exam. So this was late 2011. I was right. able to practice. But he showed up under the pretense of just wanting to get to know us. Right. And then by the end of that meeting, we were somehow resource speakers that I spent the next two years of the practice in Southeast Ohio, two nights a week, sometimes in front little, you know, tractor shops, right. You know, where if I moved too far to one way, I would get greased up by the right. <laughs> open, open rotors. Uh, and sometimes at churches and community centers, but that guy, that guy, he, yep. he, came in and tricked us. But here's the thing. He actually knew us because he was a high school classmate of your mother. Yeah, exactly. Down at Danville. So he he knew at least your mom and me, okay? But yeah, he came in and said, I was vetting you. And then, yes, we, we made many trips to many places. You probably, because I had the, the majority of the practice yes. at that time. Yeah, you got to go to talk to many. Uh, I remember one one workshop where we were talking where you had to watch out or you get grease on yourself. Yeah, that yourself. was, a, that was the tractor up. shop down in Coshocton. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So at that time, we didn't know uh, where the play was going to be, how far it right. was going to go. There was talk about it going all the way out to Western Ohio before it finally, the, you know, became defined as being kind of in that crescent that's centered around Jefferson, Harrison, Belmont, and Monroe yep. County, which is where it became really hot. Um, so, yeah, that was that was an interesting thing. Uh, you kind of put the stars together, and we were able to make an impact. Uh, I've, I've got to say this about the Farm Bureau. Among all landowner advocacy groups, they probably value education yeah. as much as any anybody else. So Dale will sit down with people in uh, their kitchens, uh, to discuss, uh, you know, what's going on in the industry. We'll always say, listen, you need to go talk to a oil, good oil and gas attorney about this. You were fortunate enough to be right at the top of the list of Farm Bureau recommended landowner advocates. Well, so. six years of teaching, while well, we thought, boy, that was just a phase, ended up having a significant impact Great. on the start of my career as, a, as an attorney because I was spending so much time teaching still. I treated those opportunities as opportunities to educate. Well, and that's one of our core values is the empowerment. Uh, it's it's not just like we're we're a hospital where you come in and we say sign on the dotted line and we'll we'll take you to surgery right. and you know you, you may or may not know what's going on. We believe our clients and that especially in oil and gas landowners in general can be empowered by knowledge. Because it's knowledge that you're not going to hear from the landman who works for the oil and gas producer. We we're going to try to even the scales at least on that level. Right. So uh, yeah, that was that was a wild time, and then the pipelines came along, and that was that was a it, lot of work. It was, and so, in the beginning of 2012, we formed White Law Office, right? comma CO. At Company, that point, yeah. <laughs> we were we partnered up and did it, and boy. That puts us 12 years into that endeavor. Right. And it's crazy to think there's people who a year after that have st are still with us. Yeah. Uh, sometimes scratch your head as to why. Yeah, I know. Some of these folks, you know, like Ken and Matthew and, uh, and those, those kinds of folks who have been with us for a long time. I don't know if that was when um, uh, 
what administratively we call the center of the universe when Erica came pretty on close, yeah. pretty close. I mean, Ken has been so actually one guy who joined us that I just have to mention him because he was such a key part mm-hmm. of our early practice. Gary. Oh, Gary Orand. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw Gary at the store the other day. Well, Gary got the chance to catch up with him for a few minutes, but that guy, he was one of our key guys well, that defined what we could do right. as a practice early on. So Gary came to us as our private investigator. And Gary put together, in, in any piece of litigation, the key thing is to nail down the facts. And Gary was a former lieutenant with the Sheriff's Department when I was prosecutor. He was my chief probation officer when I was judge. He retired from that, came to... Uh, came to work with us. I remember I ran into his wife and said, you got to give some Gary something to do because he's just sitting around the house. So he came in and, uh, and really put together our system where we analyze facts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, because once you get the kind of the timeline of what happened, what we can prove happened, then you can start the interpretation process and the advocacy process. But uh, Gary was also a process server. Some people, especially small oil and gas producers. Who, Catching them while they're stuck in a snow drift. Yeah. He, he once got a tip that somebody was that he'd been looking for for a couple months was stuck in a snow drift, and he went down and snow, served him in the, uh, in the snow drift. Yeah. 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 But then guys like Ken, who's been here 11 years. Yeah, I don't know. Can you figure that I, out? I Glutton for punishment, it yeah. must be. Ken Hostetler takes, it takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of abuse within the firm. He's just such a nice guy. Yeah, and he's now co-owner. Yeah, you know, bought in earlier this year. Erica, obviously, we've had a lot of people come. We've had right. a, not a great fit. And I think the interesting part of it was we always wanted to provide, as you coined, best in class services, right. but we didn't know, always know how to run a business of the delivery of legal services. Because a lot of practitioners are really good problem solvers. Right. They're really good helping people with the law, but they're not great business people. And I I was a teacher, went to law yeah. school. So I was, all I did was throw myself at trying to answer that question. And we have evolved since that time into a place that truly values the ability to be best in class practitioners who have solid business understanding of how we can be successful as a firm but not necessarily as many firms do either being a mega firm so you have these different departments that serve different needs um, but not being afraid to explore new niches like oil and gas and uh, now we've got uh, homeowner association representation uh, we've got uh, a very well-developed transactional practice since you and I are talking in Bunker Hill outside of Berlin. Yep. Which, um, Ken, growing up in an Anabaptist background, you know, it makes it easier for um, folks who are buggy bound not to have to drive, hire a driver to go into the county seat. They can come here and, um, and uh, be home in the same day with just a buggy ride. So, um, yeah, it, it's... I've taken the position, especially since we went through the succession where you're now the Mm -hmm. majority owner of the firm and I I can just do what I like to do, which is practice law. Um, It's interesting to see what's going to happen next. What's the next niche that we look at? So from two guys that said, which is going to be the two of us, we're going to serve Holmes County, you know, high Mm -hmm. speed, low drag, lean into tech. There's now 35 people. 14 practitioners, eight locations, 50 practice areas, and over 200 years of legal experience at on tap in a very, very collaborative environment. Correct. And while I'd say this isn't what we envisioned while we started, I don't know if I'd trade it for much other else because this is a great group of people to work with. We do have wonderful people. Um, like you say, not everybody and uh, not every idea has worked out. But uh, we try to be nimble in addressing opportunities. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, uh, as the uh, quote-unquote senior partner, which is translated into old guy within the firm, um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting ride. Yeah. 